read uh, this morning out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're just going to read um, out of that 13th chapter, 4 through um, 7, maybe the first sentence of 8. Um, love is patient. Love is kind. It uh, does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. Uh, it is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Um, it keeps no record of wrong. Love does not uh, delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. I like this last part in verse in uh, verse seven. Um, it just reiterates. It tells it. It's an exclamation point on what love truly is. It always protects. Um, it always trusts. Always, always hopes and always perseveres. And then just that first part of verse uh, 8, it says that love, it never fails. Not one time when you administer love, does it does it fail you? It always comes back with something really good. This week as I was studying, um, I, you know, you just do what you normally do and, and you go through... Uh, the books of the Bible, and you ask God, you know, what what is it that you want me to, you know, talk about, God? I mean, what is it that you um, you need for me to say so that you're speaking through me so that somebody that walks into a room on Sunday morning gets exactly what they need out of the service, whatever that is. And uh, I fell in love with this um, this book this week that I really, to be honest with you, in 20 years of ministry, I have not paid much attention to the book of Philemon. I've read it. We've all probably read it at one time or another. We've scanned over it. It's a letter from Paul to to Philemon, and and um, it's a great it's a great letter that Paul wrote. Whatever. But for some reason this week, as I read this letter, it just it just jumped um, into my mind and into my spirit, and and I just fell in love with what he was saying. Uh, and so I wanted to share this story of Philemon with you this morning in regards to the love that Paul has for Philemon and also for the love that Paul is asking for Philemon to have towards a man named Onesimus. And so, Paul begins this letter and and he starts to write it. And let's just jump to, uh, there's only one chapter there, but verse 4, it says, I, uh, I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Talking about Philemon here. I pray that you uh, may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. He's really encouraging Philemon that uh, I've heard about your love, I've heard about your actions, I know that you care about people that are around you. And, um, and so he says in verse 7, Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because, uh, because you, brother, have refreshed the heart's of the saints. And so Philemon, uh, at this point, has become somebody with inside his community that has done something good for God because Paul has heard about it. He's heard the love that he's expressed. And Paul had spent some time with Philemon before this point because Paul is the one that brought Philemon to Christ. He is the missionary that spent time with this man and, and told him who God was in his own life and so Philemon uh, gets the, the benefit of, of all of Paul's experience and all of Paul's talks and all of his discipleship. Philemon is the one that gets to stay there in his hometown, and he's the one that continues to express all of this love and gratitude to all of the saints, making sure that they're taken care of and, um, and everything is good in that church that uh, Philemon is in. Paul at this time is in prison. And he's 
has chains on him at the time. And that's where he writes this letter from to Philemon. And so I just want you to know some of the history of this so you know where this love comes from, where you know exactly the attitude in which these things are written because it might be difficult for us to be in that same position or that same spot and do the same things. But let me just remind you once again that love never fails. And so when you express this uh, out of love, it, it is always going to come back in a good response eventually. So Paul is in this place. He's shackled. He's chained to a wall. And he's writing Philemon. And he's telling him, I've heard all these great things about you and all these great things you've done. And you have taken care of all of those people there. And you've grown the church. And, and I'm so proud of you for all that you've done. But Paul is fixing to push Philemon one more step in love. Just one more uh, area of love. And I, I think maybe at this point Philemon doesn't even know that it's coming. Can you put yourself in Paul's shoes for just a moment? Been shipwrecked, have went to jail for no apparent reason other than just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you're shackled to a wall, you're chained there, you have no freedom of your own. At that point, a lot of times when we feel like we have been taken advantage of, or maybe people haven't listened to us, or maybe that things aren't necessarily going our way, or or it, it's just not working out, or maybe, uh, you know, you, you've attended church and things just haven't changed, and it's just not, it's just not going good. Sometimes our attitudes are one that we just, we just say, well, it's just not working out. I'm done with this. I just, I give up. We know that when we give up um, on anything, there's regrets. On anything, there's regrets when you just give up. Well, I was going to play basketball all season, but the coach made me mad, and so I just quit. You know? And then you wonder the rest of your life. You know, you're 55 years old now, and you wondered. I wonder if I could have just really stuck in and maybe I could have made something out of myself if I would have. And there's just, there's just regrets in our lives because we don't continue on with certain things. Man, I remember when my, when my parents, you know, they bought me that piano or they bought me that guitar. Or maybe it was a trumpet or a flute for you. And for the first week, you played it. I mean, you played it, and you played it, you know, to the best of your ability, which was not very good. Y your parents or your grandparents or whoever you lived with would, would ask you, could you do that maybe in another room? You know, maybe, maybe go outside. You know, the birds love to hear guitars outside, Gary, you know. And you played it for a little while, but then all of a sudden... Yeah, you weren't really able to pick up songs very quickly. You became bored with it, whatever. And then you you put it in a closet somewhere. And then 5, 10, 20 years later, you're saying, you know, I wish I would have just stuck with it. And I wish that I could, I could play that instrument now, you know? Gary, yeah, I've been learning the guitar for the last 20 years. I, I know G, C... D, E minor, I can almost make an F, and I can play absolutely zero songs. You know? Man, I wish I would have stuck with it. I wish that I would have continued on. If I just would have practiced it more and put more effort into it, then I, I think by this time, I might not be up to, to Gary's standard, you know, quality of, of play or Chris's or, or John's. But at least I could stand maybe occasionally on a stage somewhere and, you know, off in a corner and just play and, and feel good about that. But I, I can't do that. Well, I can, but, you know, they wouldn't let me plug in. Paul has come to this point in his life where a lot of us might have just given up. And he's still writing letters to friends. 
that he had met along the way, that he had come in contact with, that he had had influence over. And he tells Philemon, I've heard about everything you've done. I, I'm, I've not given up on what I'm doing, even though that I'm in, in chains. And I know that you're not giving up on what you're doing, even though you're free to be able to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people around you. There's no regrets there for them. There's no looking back or thinking, you know, should I have done this differently or what, you know. Even in chains, Paul finds himself encouraging other people. He loves them so much that he, he pins this letter with chains, with chains on his hands to Philemon because he wants to express the love that he has for him. When's the last time you just wrote a note to somebody? When's, when's, the, last time that, when's the last time that you were making lunch for your husband to take to work? Times are hard. Economy's tough. Burgers are seven bucks, so you pack a lunch, right? When's the last time you just wrote a note on a napkin and just said, I love you more than anything? When's the last time, just out of the blue, you text somebody that you care about a tremendous amount and you just said, hey, I was thinking about you today and I wanted you to know that you're a really good friend to me, and I appreciate it. When's the last time that you just took time to show your love to somebody? Because Paul, in chains, it, nothing's going to stop him at this point. He is going to continue on the ministry, even though they've, they've taken away his voice in, in some way. I mean, he, he can scream it maybe through the prison walls or something, but he can't go to where Philemon's at, so he takes the time out of his life and still continues to love. He does not. And we'll learn as much, I, I think we learn as much from this. He does not show the anger and the pain and the disgust and I can't believe God has me here in this place in my life and I, you know, I, I've, I've come so far and I've done so much for God and he's just left me here in these chains and Philemon, I just want you to know right now that you know, if God takes you to the same place He's taken me, then maybe you should just quit. Because, I mean, it's just, it's, it's wet, it's cold, it's damp, it's, it's just not a place that you want to be, Philemon, and I just want you to know it's just stupid here. Sometimes that's how we express ourselves to people. You know, it's just never good, it's just never good enough, it's always bad, there's just the news, it's getting worse, you know, and oh, just so tired, you know, of all, but Paul's not that way. No matter where he's at, no matter what he's doing, Paul is saying, I love Christ and Christ loves me and I'm going to invest in other people's lives so that they'll continue on what I know is true and what I know is real and what I know is right. And, and so I'm going to write this letter to Philemon to encourage him to do something great. And so Philemon, in this point, is kind of being set up because there's this, this man that Paul has run across named Onesimus. He was employed by Philemon, if you, if you call it that way, if you say it that way. He was a slave. To Philemon. He had, he had been with Philemon for a long time. Onesimus was with Paul at this time when he was writing this letter. Here's what Onesimus did. Onesimus had taken money from Philemon. Philemon was well off. Uh, he had slaves, people that would work for him. He, he, uh, he was to do, you know, at that time. He, he had influence in where he was. And Onesimus took money from Philemon and left. He's caught, he's captured, he's with Paul now, fixing to be released. And Philemon, er, Paul is sending this letter to Philemon, asking Philemon to take Onesimus back. Not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. 
I want you to think about this just a second with me. Philemon, Onesimus was a slave. Onesimus took money from me. Then he left. I didn't know where he was. This friend of mine named Paul says he's coming back. I don't know if I want him to come back. He's a jerk. He stole from me once. He'll probably steal from me again. You know, I I just, I don't know. But here's what Paul's doing. He's setting Philemon up, and he's like, you remember all the time I invested in you, Philemon. You remember the, the things that I did for you, and so I want you, more like you owe me, Philemon, to take Onesimus back into your home, but not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. You, you, I've heard about how much that you loved and how much you cared and how much you were building the church up. And let's just test that out for just a moment, if we can. I've got a brother in Christ. I call him son now, is what Paul says. I'm a father in Christ to Onesimus. He is my son. He is my disciple. He is the one that I've taught. He knows all about Christ. And he would, he would be somebody that I would, would want to keep with me, Paul said. But I wouldn't want to just jump to conclusions that he would be better to stay with me I'm going to send him back to you because he'll be valuable to you and to the church that's around. Onesimus, the slave, Onesimus, the guy that steals from us, Onesimus. Maybe you could come back, Paul, but I don't know about that guy. We are so quick in our lives to take people and categorize them. You know, we allow certain people in as friends and then we let... Other people stay at a distance. We'll we'll let people come in, and if they take from us, or if they take advantage of us, or they do something that we don't like, we immediately put up a wall, and we send them somewhere else. Sometimes I understand that. People are mean. They're vindictive. People, People will do things that are selfish and rude, and they brag on themselves all the time, and you just get absolutely tired of it. So... Don't ask me and don't call me and tell me you should let them in because they're a Christian. Sometimes we just don't think people change. You know? I went to high school with you. I know. I know how you were. I used to work with you and I watched you as you left Tinker and you would would justify it by saying they don't use it anymore and you just take what they had. I, I remember. I... I remember how you are. But Onesimus had spent time with Paul. And if you spent any time with Paul, you had to spend some time with Christ. So Onesimus had spent all this time learning about who Christ was. And his life began to change. And Paul is saying his life is different. He knows how to love now. He knows how to express that now. He didn't know before. He was, he was captive. He was enslaved. He was, he was working for nothing. But now he has something to work for, and he's valuable to you. Yesterday I was talking to a couple friends, and we were talking about the Super Bowl, and we were saying, hey, who do you think will win? And one guy said, well, 49ers for sure. And, um, and I don't really know who. I, 49ers probably are the best team. I, I don't know. And I said something about, well, I just, you know, the Ravens, I watched Ray Lewis, he's a linebacker, uh, played with the Ravens all of his life, and I watched him this last playoff game as he, as he knelt down, I say knelt, he dropped to his knees and he was praying right in the middle of the field, 50 yard line, and all these cameras were taking pictures of him and everything, and I just, I really don't know much about Ray Lewis, I know he's uh, like 13 uh, all pro you know, he, he, he's unbelievable linebacker. I heard he got into some trouble at one time in his life. He thought he killed somebody or was in something. Somebody shot somebody or stabbed somebody. Or, you know, I just, I don't know much about him. But I thought, you know, it was weird. That, I mean, I remember he all of this adversity, all this stuff, and then all of a sudden I see him. That intrigues me. And so we had a conversation. Do you think he's really changed, or is this just like an act? You know, is he really serving God? And 
And we really were just kind of confused. I mean, I don't know. I mean, he says he knows Christ, and he he was praying in the middle of the 50-yard line in the, right there in the field. And you know, if, if his life's really changed, it'd be kind of hard to fake it with all of those other football players around. You would think they would know what his actions were throughout the week, and they would just call it out on it, wouldn't they? Wouldn't they just say... Well, you act like this, you're praying on the 50-yard line, but, you know, you got six children from, I think, six different women. Really? Man, you're praying at the 50-yard line? You're probably just a player like you were then. So it's really, really hard to have or to get over that image that you've painted of your life. And that's kind of where Onesimus was. Really? I mean, you stole the money from your master, the person that you were working for, and really, I mean, you went and got yourself arrested or imprisoned, you know, and it's hard to give people the benefit of the doubt that they might have changed over a period of time. How's your love life today? Are you in the basket where you're the one that's saying, I'm not going to let anybody in that's ever hurt me in my whole life, and I'm going to put up walls, and this Christianity thing that we're talking about is solely for a group of people that I allow into my life and nobody else. Are you one of those that maybe had a rocky past? You know, we've all done things that we are not proud of. You know, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. We have all done things that if we could take it back, we would. We rewind it and start from there. And it's hard sometimes to be able to get over those uh, those things that people say about us. Maybe like Ray Lewis. A lot of people questioned his salvation with God because of his actions in the past. And a lot of people question your, act, your, your actions in the past. And a lot of people question whether or not your relationship with God is true or right or real because of what you do or where you've been or, you know, it's just how life is. I'm asking us today to look at these three men. Paul, the one writing the letter. I'm asking you to look at him and then look at yourself and, and ask yourself, how's my love life? Am I investing in people enough that no matter if I'm at highs or lows or where I am at my life, that I don't let life influence me, but I influence life? Did you hear that? That you, that you don't let life influence you. You don't let it change who you are and what you are in Christ. But you let what you are in Christ change other people's lives like Paul has done. He tells him, he tells him, Philemon, if he owes anything to you, if you have anything that you hold against Onesimus at all, then you put it on my tab. I'm good for it. That's a friend. That's somebody that loves somebody else. No matter what the cost is, I'm going to pay for you to be able to get out of the place that you're in. So there's really nothing that's going on here that keeps him from coming back and being very effective in, in, in your church. Are you like that Paul that is discipling and growing and teaching and pushing people to where they're the very best that they can be? Because God needs you today to be that. It's not my personality. It's not what I do. It's not... It is. It is. It is who you are. It is what you are. It's who you could be. Are you a pole today that you can, you can really take the people that are around you and encourage them to the point that they're doing something greater and better for Christ? Because love is not self-seeking. Love is not love is not self-seeking. Love, love doesn't boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. It doesn't easily anger. 
and it keeps no records of wrong. And if that's the case, then we've got a lot of work to do in our lives to show people that Christ is real and able to work through them. Are you like Philemon today that might have some questions in their mind about allowing or if people have the right to come back into the church or have the right to be able to be saved? They, they, you know, a lot of us, a lot of times we'll take and we'll judge people and we'll just say that, I just don't know if their actions are true. I don't know if their actions are real. I, I, I'm just not sure about. I said it last week, and I'll say it again, just because I'm on a big kick about it. Let's give people the benefit of the doubt, that they really are trying. Let's give people the benefit of the doubt to the point that we help them get to a point. And if they betray, betray us, if they, if they take advantage of us, if they truly don't do what's right in God, then let's deal with that at a later point. But until that point happens and until that point comes, you've got to realize those people that do those type of things are sick. They are without God and without love. And no wonder that they're boastful and proud and, 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 and self-seeking and, and all of those different things because they don't know love like you know love. They're not able to express love because they've not experienced love like you, you've been able to express through Christ. So are you like Philemon today where you need a letter written to you and, and, and God is saying this morning, I'm going to send people back into your life where there's an opportunity for you to continue to disciple them and to teach them about my word. There's an opportunity today so that you can use them for the furthering of the gospel. The last one, maybe you're like Onesimus. Where you said, I have done so much wrong that I fled and I ran. And now God's saying to you, just like Paul said to Philemon, if you owe anything, put it on my tab. God says, I've paid, I've paid the price. I've paid the price. And when you allow God to come into your heart and you start that relationship, you too get to start feeling what love truly is. And it just changes you forever. You're slow to anger. You're not self-seeking as much anymore not near as rude as what you once were. You look out for other people instead of yourself. And so maybe you're like Onesimus today and, and you say to yourself, I need to right what was wrong. I need to get that off my back. I need to quit feeling guilty about it. I need to, to let that go so that I can be useful once again. Maybe God's restoring you back to his kingdom today. Maybe a place where you used to love and used to work, a place called church, you've not been able to do that for a long, long time because of the actions, the way that you maybe left another church or maybe the way you felt about another church. Maybe God's bringing you here this morning and he's saying to you, he's saying, here's an open door and I've wrote, I, I, I've wrote a letter before you and I've told these people that you love and that you care and that it is a place for you. So I ask you once again, how's your love life this morning? I was going to write a letter. Today. I'd ask. That people would accept you. For just who you are. Because I've been around you enough to know. That you're caring. That you love people.
I really feel like that I could continue to write and say these people would do anything that I asked them to do in Christ. I was to write a letter today about the relationship that I have with my God. I would tell God I love you so much. I don't desire to be all these things, proud and boastful and rude and self-seeking and easily angered and keeping all the records of how people have done me wrong. I, I really, God, just want to love you and that to be able to show and shine through. If I was to ask you this morning, how's your love life? And you would begin to write a letter to God and tell him how your love life truly is, what would you pin? A love life is great. I show it all the time. Or would you say, I better buy a really nice gift because something's got to make up for the lack of love that I've shown. Are you Paul? The one that invests. The one that just sticks with Christ no matter what. Are you Philemon today? The one that has to have a, re a letter written to him because Paul has to encourage him today to make sure that he's going to accept Onesimus back into the church where he is going to stay. Are you Philemon today? Or are you Onesimus? The one that just needs to be able to erase the past, be able to get to work, start loving, opening up the doors so that you can show love to everybody else.